Welcome to Madang. Today's amazing guest is Caitlin Curtis, a poet, an author, and a public speaker. She is an enrolled citizen of the Potawatomi Nation and has grown up in the Christian faith. Today's episode of Madang Podcast, she discusses her latest book, Native, Identity, Belonging, and Rediscovering God. She shares about water, about land, about spiritual places, about baptism, white supremacy, and so much more. Please stay tuned. This week's sponsor is Homebrewed Christianity's open online class, Upsetting the Powers, the Legacy of James Cone. Xavier University professor of Black theology and student of James Cone, Dr. Adam Clark, is partnering with Homebrewed Christianity in an exploration of the life, thought, and legacy of James Cone, the founder of Black theology. If Black lives matter to our life as a species and a church, then it is time to listen to the voices who have already been speaking and living this gospel proclamation. In addition to six sessions exploring Cone's most powerful texts, there are six special guest sessions where friends and colleagues of Cone will share personally about his impact. These include scholars like Serene Jones, Kelly Brown Douglas, and Gary Dorian. This group is pay what you can, and you don't have to join live to get the video or audio of each session. To learn more and join over 1,000 others in the group, head to jamescohnwasright.com. The Buddhist Suu Kyi Foundation and Green Faith invites listeners to join us at Living the Change, a global multi-faith initiative journeying with people of faith, spirit, and conscience to change how we live as part of our response to the climate emergency. Through Living the Change, we aim to catalyze rapid and large reductions of personal greenhouse gas emissions of people of faith, spirit, and conscience as part of the collective pursued efforts to stay below the mean global warming temperature of 1.5 degrees Celsius. We focus specifically on changes that have the biggest impact on individual emissions in the heaviest polluting communities, changing how we travel, eat, and power our homes. Living the Change welcomes everyone who wants to walk gently on Earth together, while concentrating especially on people with the highest carbon footprints. To find out more, please visit www.livingthechange.net or follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Living the Change. Pacific Asian and North American Asian Women in Theology and Ministry will hold its 36th annual conference virtually from March 17 to 19, 2022. It will begin with a public forum on cross-racial solidarity in times like these on March 17 at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Leading Asian American, Latinx, and African American scholars will speak. To donate to Pan Autumn, please go to www.panautumn.org. Show your support and please order Invisible, available wherever books are sold. For sponsorship inquiries, please email madangpodcast.gmail.com. This is Madang, an outdoor living room for guests to share their experiences and their work. I invite you to come in and stay for a while. Welcome to Madang. Today's amazing guest is Caitlin Curtis, a poet, author, and public speaker. She is an enrolled citizen of the Potawatomi Nation and has grown up in the Christian faith. She writes on the intersection of Indigenous spirituality, faith in everyday life, and decolonization within the church. Her latest book, Native, Identity, Belonging, and Rediscovering God, is about identity, soul-searching, and being on the never-ending journey of finding ourselves and finding God. As both a citizen of the Potawatomi Nation and a Christian, Curtis offers a unique perspective on these topics 
And in this book, she shows how reconnecting with her identity both informs and challenges her faith. Caitlin has contributed to On Being, Religious News Service, USA Today, and Sojourners, among others, and was interviewed for her New Yorker, for the New Yorker on colonization within Christian missions. Today, I'm so excited to have Caitlin on Madang podcast to discuss her newest book, Native. Sarah Bassi writes, it isn't very often that a book about identity, let alone dismantling white supremacy and patriarchy, reads like a poem. But that's Caitlin. She is thoughtful, she is thoughtful decolonization set to music and wrapped in love. So welcome, Caitlin. It's such a pleasure to have you here on Madang. Thank you so much for having me. It took a while to reschedule and schedule this interview. So I'm just so glad that we can do this in the midst of pandemic and um, schools closing and reopening. So thank you so much for coming on today. Oh, yeah, thank you. It's wonderful to hear you read um, an endorsement of my book because we don't always read our endorsements like you forget about them. They're there. It's really sweet to hear. Um, someone read the words that other people have said, you know? Uh -huh. like well, you have a ton of great endorsements. I just picked one. So I'm <laughs> glad that you enjoyed that one. And I like, it. I'm, you know, if someone read my endorsements too, it gives a little lift to the day. So I'm glad yeah. you enjoyed Sarah. She's an amazing writer. Yes. So I'm, yeah, I would love to have her endorsement of one of my <laughs> books too. <laughs> maybe one day if she listens to my podcast, maybe she'll endorse another bo yeah. uh, book of mine. <laughs> So anyway, welcome, and I'm so glad um, to have you here. I know we're not that far from each other, so hopefully one of these days we can meet in person. That's always a dream of mine to meet. You know, I have had friends on my Madang podcast, but um, not everyone is a friend. So uh, some of my guests I would really love to meet in real life. So maybe one of these days. So um, Caitlin, you've done a lot of um, writing and a lot of work, and I know um, you don't really like the word activism, but you are presently engaged in some work outside of your writing. So if you could kind of share with us what you are doing. Yeah, um, so I've moved twice during COVID, and so I feel like uh, the last year and a half has been such a strange like twilight zone. Um, we lived in Vermont for almost a year <laughs> and we moved to Philadelphia. So I feel like I've been, um, you know, getting to know land in different places, getting to know cultures and people, not necessarily in a personal way, but like those first meetings of saying hello and trying to learn how to introduce myself as I am. But one thing that has been really beautiful for me that's unfolded as I've moved and because of the gift of virtual conversations is doing um, more uh, like inner spiritual conversations and relationships and interfaith dialogue. Um, I, I did a, um, I was a part of a group with the Aspen Institute and uh, a group of us met and talked about like anti-racism within our faith communities. Oh. And uh, that was really wonderful to be a part of it. We didn't get to meet in person, but being on the Zoom calls together and just asking these hard questions and getting to know one another as best we could. And since moving to Philadelphia, I'm excited to get to be a part of some like interfaith organization. So I'm, wow. I'm slowly finding my way with that. And, and I feel like right now during COVID slow is the only way to move. So I'm <laughs> slowly. And sometimes it feels like nothing is happening. And when, when, what's weird about this time we're living in is so much is online. So much has to be online. So when social media feels exhausting uh, and sometimes the writing feels exhausting, it's like, where else do we go? And, you know, and we usually go to relationships or we go to hobbies or other things, you know? And so I'm, I feel like I'm finding my way in our new community as well. And, um, and hopefully when things get a little, easier and um we're able to travel more safely then you know my speaking events will start up again and some of those in-person connections will start up but i've been really grateful to get to put to practice some of that interfaith relationship and um i'm working on a new book and so that's 
um, inspiring a lot of what I'm writing is those conversations and that spirit of connection. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that you're writing because I think so many of us, you know, just loved your book Native and can't wait to hear more um, from you. So before we actually get into that, um, you know, you are a poet and, you know, one of my secret desires as a little kid and even now is to become a poet one day. So, Mm -hmm. but to me, it's so difficult So, you know, when did you begin writing poetry? And if you have any suggestions for some of us who aspire to be poets, you know, tell us something. Yeah, Um, I think I've been always writing poetry. I think I went to the ocean. I think our family went to California when I was like five or six, maybe. And I, I wrote a poem and brought it home. And my mom had ended up typing it on a piece of paper and putting it in a frame. So it was in my bathroom for years. And it was just some, you know, really cheesy, like rhymy poem by a six-year-old about the ocean. So I think that um, music is poetry, just set to music. Um, and so music has always been such a huge part of my inner world. And so words, poetry, music, all just, it just naturally has happened, I think. But um you know, I took poetry courses in high school, college, that was, it was important for me to learn about poetry, but also to just do it, right? Um, I think something that has helped me, a few things that have helped me is to have a few favorite poets, like some, someone who I really loved in college um, was the poet Billy Collins. Um, His poetry is just very um, human, like nonchalant, just every day about anything, right? Like about, you know, one of his poems is about a country mouse that that finds a match. And then as it's running along the inside wall of this house, it catches in the house. <laughs> That's what the, the poem's about, you know, like these things that, that people wouldn't think about normally. Mm-hmm. Um, but that's just really beautiful to me because that's just what life is. So I gleaned a lot from his poetry and of course Mary Oliver you have poets that just um write about humanity and which many poets do of course I can name so many more but um those are two that stick out and it wasn't that I wanted to copy you know what they do but it's that the spirit of how they came to poetry was meaningful for me so I think finding what kind of poet like makes you feel the way you would want to convey a poet, a poem, you know? Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is that nature always brings out poetry for me. So even just staring out a window, I have a window right here, even just staring out a window for a while or being able to go out and go on a hike or on a a quiet walk or being by the ocean or by a mountain. um, There's something about the earth that just pulls creativity from us. And for me, it often pulls it out in the form of a poem. And of course they don't, rhyme. Mine don't rhyme. Sometimes people's do. Mine don't. Um, And they just come out and they're a form, of course, of a story. They're just a little different. Um, So I don't know if that's helpful, but that's- Oh, that is so helpful. me, you know, that help pull it out of me sometimes. That's so helpful. And I like the way that you said poetry and music. You know, I grew up in a very conservative household and we weren't allowed to listen to music. So maybe that inhibited me. (laughs) Yeah, because my mother is like, you know, all music is bad and things like that. So you could experiment with that and listen, even listening to different sorts of music or Mm -hmm. lyrics and see what it pulls out. Or even just music that doesn't have lyrics. Sometimes we listen to instrumental music and it uh-huh. it still pulls those emotions out that could have words with them you know okay so I'm gonna those are really great words of wisdom so I'm going to uh cherish them and see if yeah. any poetry comes out of my body <laughs> I love but thank you so much for sharing it because your poetry is so life-giving and it's so beautiful so thank you so much for um, your work and your writing. So now, you know, with your book, Native, it is such a um, fabulous book. And, you know, we had a faculty retreat um, at Earlham School of Religion, and we all had to answer a question, what book kind of have you read in the last few months? And I shared it was your book, and it was so life-changing for me. Um, you know, I get goosebumps kind of writing, reading the words, you know, from 
the page, like the words just kind of lift up. So, you know, to begin talking about your book, what kind of led you to write this so important and kind of life-giving book? It was really life-giving for me because, you know, I'm an immigrant, but some of the stories you shared and about, you know, white privilege and things that we will get into, you know, really touched me and moved me. So what led you to write this book? Well, I love that you said that. First of all, what I want to say is I'm so grateful when I hear that my books has spoken to so many different kinds of people because Mm -hmm. you're asked who's your target audience. Every time you write a book, that's the question. And I, I hate that question because I want to just put like human beings are my target audience, you know, all humans. Um, It's hard to say, you know, my book is for white evangelical pastors of age 35 to 50, or, you know, I wanted a book that could just be human and could tell human stories from a specific, obviously a specific story, my story, but that I wanted it to also be a mirror or to be a gift to certain people to help them process their own identity or their own story or their own, you know, experiences with colonization um, or with beauty or with, you know, whatever it is. So I want to say that first, that it always means a lot to me to know that that my words and my stories um, speak to people who are different than I am because we have to be able to share those experiences with one another. And that means so much to me. Um, This story came out of my own just journey of grieving and and coming to process my own um, journey with trauma. And, you know, I mean, a lot of the, the, I, I had already, I already knew I wanted to write this book, even when my first book came out, like it was already, it was already being created in me. Um, and so it didn't take long to try to get, get a book deal and start writing. So by the time I, I started writing, I already knew, you know, sort of the layout of the book and what I, what I wanted to say. I already had like a chart on my wall, like a bubble, a bubble graph that had all the sections and all, you know, and I knew I wanted to talk about the Potawatomi flood story. Cause this is a, huge, it's our, it's like our creation story. You know, you have flood stories from all over the world. If you study religions or cultures, you know, that all sorts of peoples have flood stories. It's a beautiful thing. Um, and so to tell my flood story of like, this is a story about beginning again. And that was what I was trying to do is growing up in the Baptist church and in the evangelical church, how do I begin again, knowing what I know and, and, coming back home to myself, to these parts of myself that I had cut off for so long or had had been told I needed to cut off, right? So, you know, it was a hard book to write. It was really hard. And of course it came out during COVID. And, but what I realized is that it needed to come out during this time because it's a story about the, the world is gone and we have to create something new. And that's what we're doing now in our society, in the world. Like, the world we knew before is sort of gone and and we're all grieving and asking who we are. And so what are we going to create from that? And I feel like that's exactly what this book is, is doing that. And at least in my, for myself, but also I hope as, as people, as the church, if people need to ask that question as America, <laughs> you know, who, who do we want to become and what stories are we listening to and telling each other? And can we hold space for one another better. So I think that, I think that sums up some of it. (laughs) Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing because that's what many of us writers aspire. You know, my latest book Invisible came out and I thought that's exactly what I wanted people to identify, but I, I feel like it's just for a small little audience of Asian Americans, but you were able to, you know, me as an Asian American can identify and to hear your words is so empowering and it's very challenging because it, you know, there's so many parts of it that provoke so many thoughts and questions of what I am doing and what um, white people are doing, what black people are doing, you know, we are able to identify with your story and your quest for finding your identity and finding God. So I just really appreciate it. I'm so grateful that you wrote it. And, you know, as you said, um, we are creating new worlds. And I think it's a perfect book 
for all of us to kind of delve into to find out how do we become new in this time of COVID and even after COVID. So thank you. And I wanted to ask you about the flood story, but you already mentioned it. And as you said, you know, so many of us all have flood stories. So I, I really appreciate you sharing yours. And then you tied it in with your baptism. I don't know if you wanted to say something more about your baptism with the flood story. Oh, um, yeah, I do write about that a little bit. I, well, I was baptized when I was seven. So, you know, had the whole, <laughs> <laughs> the immersion, you know, yeah. And then getting baptized in, um, you know, it was very, um, it, at that time, it was a very meaningful experience for me. And I write about in the book, even that, the ways that we have taken uh, water, this, this sacred gift. And we've sort of like said, you know, this special thing that the earth it has given us this gift from the earth. It's only special if it's inside a church in a baptismal. And other than that, it doesn't really count. Or, you know, like the things that we do where we, um, we take these sacred things that are already sacred and already a gift. And then we say they're only allowed to be sacred if they're put into this building or put, you know, like created, recreated for our own religion or, and that's just what humans have always done. But it, it, it is problematic when, <laughs> you know, when we um, force people out based on those things, those rules that we've created, those boxes that we create, um, it can really cause a lot of damage too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and then you write about physical spaces or spiritual spaces. I thought that was so important for me to hear because I'm always going against dualism and Christianity, you know, emerging in the Greco-Roman period, we just divided the world. Yeah. And as you just said about water is sacred, but then we bring it into the church and put in a tiny little bottle or a little basket. We say, you know, now that this is sacred water. So can you just share a bit more about physical spaces are spiritual places yeah well I love that you said something about non-dualism because that's another aspect of my writing and many of us who are trying to write in sort of non-linear non-western ways is that our cultures and our ways of storytelling are very cyclical and they're and they and they fight against that dualism and saying that um, multiple things can be true at once or multiple layers of things exist it's not just you know, it's not, it's not the way I grew up thinking, which is like, this is good. This is bad. That person's not saved. That person is, you know, this culture is unsaved, but this one isn't. I mean, that, that's the way I was taught to live. Oh, I sinned today, but, but not just now I didn't. So that's good. But, you know, it's just like always that, always that. And that I felt so much freedom when I finally got out of those boxes mm -hmm. to me, like when, when I realized God was so much wider and deeper and more expansive than what I grew up with, that was very freeing for me. I know to some people that's very scary to, when you take all the boxes away, that can be very scary, of course. But um, for me, that was very freeing and um, recognizing that physical spaces or spiritual places um, anywhere that, that the, the literal earth we inhabit is a sacred spiritual place always and we can't put everything into boxes we can't do that we can we do it but i think it um it it parts of us die when we do it you know it takes away from our humanity our our way of of loving ourselves well and loving each other well you know and and so that was important too in this book was to share about cycles and seasons and in my next book you'll see even more of that i focus on cyclical ways of processing and learning and that'll always be important to me and I think it is to many of us but it's a we have to train our brains to get rid of linear or to get rid of those those dualistic boxes it takes a while you know yeah it's taking me a lifetime you know I grew up and I remember Asian culture everyone told me it's cyclical and you know western you know they keep telling us about linear so it's very difficult for me to get out of that framework all the time. So your book was so empowering in that way. And also with the water theme and the flood, the baptism, you also mentioned about uh, Potawatomi culture, women are water protectors. And that was, it, you know, I just loved um, reading that because, you know, I go to COP meetings, the United uh, Nations meeting. And I think the one a few years ago, um, 
I forget which country it was, but we had um, indigenous people from around the world and they um, invited us to stand outside the cop building. I think it was in Marrakesh. And um, they did prayers of water women as water protectors. And they did a whole ritual. And it was so empowering for me to witness an experience. So share it with us because we all need to be reminded about women are water protectors. Yeah, and this, I wrote about this in the book. This is um, unique for me because I, I have, for a lot of my life, been very scared of water. I, like, I didn't learn to swim till I was 13 uh-huh. and still not good at it, certainly. And, um, and I just always had these like fears of drowning or my kids drowning. I just have held a lot of anxiety toward water for a lot of my life. So for my own journey, even, understanding that role as a, a Potawatomi woman, as a Quay, um, that, that we have a, a gift to give to the world in protecting the water. And when we hear about, you know, like um, Winona Leduc, so in, in Minnesota, you know, they've been fighting this pipeline, Line 3 and Bridge. And, um, and, and I know a lot of, the, of America or the world doesn't recognize what's happening there, but there is this this sacred connection for women's bodies to the water and to um, protecting the water because many times the water is not protected and harvesting, you know, the um, Honor the Earth, which is Winona LaDuke's um, organization is harvesting pipeline free wild rice. They've been harvesting it for years. And to to suddenly realize that 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 sacred meal for our people could be um, destroyed by this oil, you know, that's a, that's not just something we think, but it should viscerally like hit our bodies. It should hurt us, you know, and it's not just for women, you know, water is like what water is in our bodies. Water is the thing that we're supposed to drink every day. Um, you know, it's, it's like, it really is a medicine. It's a sacred thing, you know, to, I remind people sometimes when, just when things are heavy, sometimes I'll tweet, like, please drink your water. Please, please drink a glass of water today. Have you done that? Or when you drink it, like talk to the water or thank it for taking care of you. You know, we don't often do that. Or when you go to a body of water, like treat it as a, as a being that is like, I think when I go to water, what I'm thinking is you are so ancient and you have seen history. Like water has seen history unfolding on its skin all all of these years it has literally held everything that has happened and how can we like go to a body of water and not feel just like tiny specks of nothing (laughs) when we recognize that you know and I think that part of my own healing has been to return to that way of belonging and being and um understand that for my at least for myself through that lens yeah, thank you so much for sharing. I heard uh, Winona LaDuke spoke at my college many years ago, and she just was was very life changing experience for me to listen to her words, and you know, protecting and going against that pipeline. And so, you know, once we realize that we can't drink water, that's when we're going to start panicking. But we should be panicking now because, you know, we are slowly destroying so much. Um, of nature and the water that we need so your words are so beautiful just listening to you is just giving me goosebumps right now so thank you for sharing about the water Um, you know in your book it's interesting how you talk about community because I feel like you know you as a Native American and me as an Asian American there are so many things that intersect and community is one and you're right you know we long for community we long for oneness with the sacred Can you share a bit more about that? Yeah. I mean, I think at the core of all people is to feel connected to to the earth, to ourselves and to each other. And I think that along the way in our lives, through whatever it is, even if if it's through trauma or if it's just through assimilation or through just growing up, we are, you know, we're taught, like, even as children, we're kind of taught you, like, stop stop playing outside. Like, why are you stop being childish? Now it's time to grow up, you know? And with that comes this, this, we trade sort of the magical curiosity with, oh, I need to start learning about capitalism and my checkbook or, you know, like whatever it is like we, you know, we, it's not, um, 
no one does it on purpose. It's just part of growing up is learning these things, right? And so we lose that connection, what we call kinship with the earth. And then when we lose that, we lose a certain connection to ourself, even to our child self. And when we can't fully show up as ourselves, then it's hard to create community. It's like a, it's again, it's all cyclical and all like weaves around each other. It's all connected. And, um, you know, I grew up in the church. I became a church leader in one way or another, very young. And so I've been in church leadership in one way or another, if it's a worship leader, Bible study leader, whatever it is, you know, small group leader. Um, I have done that for so long. And it got to a point a few years ago, we were at another church and finally I wasn't in a role. Like we were just there to be there. And what I wanted more than anything was community. I wanted to connect quickly and, and get to know people. And we went there for quite a while and I felt like I hardly knew anyone. And I felt like no one really cared to know me. And then on top of that was the layers of colonization and assimilation that come with that. And so at one point we decided it was time to go because I was so angry every week. I was, what, what I saw was not community and it was not what community is supposed to be. And so eventually we left and we haven't been to church since. And what I've learned since then is that for so long, I grew up thinking that church was the only form of community I was allowed to have because that's what I had. <laughs> and I get that of course, but now I, I get to reimagine what community might be, or I get to think of community as the people I choose in solidarity with one another, or, you know, um, it's just a different way of, of practicing it. And a lot of us are asking these questions who have left the church, who have left Christianity or whatever it is, like what, since that was community for so long, now what, you know, and then we realize that community is these other thing. It, it is the earth. It is, people who are like us in different ways and then people who are not like us, but that we have a core connection. It's those interfaith or, you know, it's, it's people of different races and cultures and ethnicities who are coming together with that solidarity in mind. So we get to recreate what community is. And then we get to hopefully create community with ourselves again too. And that self-healing, I think really is part of it is part of the work. Um, it's all connected, you know? Yeah. I, I'm so glad you mentioned, um, you know, within ourselves, because I think young kids, particularly, and I have young people listening to, you know, with social media, they're so disconnected, you know, so many are, you know, so I think the healing is so important within ourselves. So I'm so grateful for you mentioning that, uh, you know, and then you touch really tough issues in your book. So, you know, you, we have the wonderful water imagery, the flood story and all that, but then you talk about white supremacy and, you know, the, you, you mentioned the threat of white supremacy did not end there. We continue to see its effects today. So, you know, we see it in politics and our culture and religion. Mm -hmm. How do we fight this? Mm -hmm. Or uh, to end it? Yeah. Well, so how I often think about this is that we're living in these macro and micro ways, right? So, so many people are activists on the macro level, right? They're trying to change systems. They're trying to, they're doing grassroots organizing. They're on the ground, right? They're, they're leading protests. They're helping people change laws. And, you know, like though that there is that macro. Mm -hmm. And then I also think there's the micro work that we have to do in our own bodies, in our own families, in our own schools and communities you know it's like um i studied social work in college and i could never decide what which one i wanted to do the macro or micro social work you know did i want to work one-on-one -on -one with clients or did i want to do the macro and i could never decide and i think now i know because because i care about both and i don't know how to say no to one or the other because then <laughs> again they're all connected right so um what i always keep in mind is that a few things is that one, this is lifelong work. Like we're even in our own lifetime, we have to remember that there are generations that will come after us and that they have to continue the work we do, that we're not going to solve all of this in our lifetime. And that in fact, some things are going to get worse in our lifetime. We're going to step back. We're going to revert to things that, that we shouldn't be reverting to. And that that's then going to fall on future generations. So what can we do in the time we have, you know, what can we do now? Um, and then, 
you know, recognizing that, that there are multiple layers and levels of how we do this work. So even if it's like asking your kids what they're learning at school about indigenous people, like what are they learning or, or better yet, go to the teachers before November and ask them what they plan to teach about it, you know, or just asking questions or reframing the narratives we've grown up with, challenging our own assumptions. Those are all maybe the micro things, you know, that we can do. I think that I think people get overwhelmed because they think they have to do all of the things, like everything. And that's what social media can make us feel sometimes is we have to hit every topic and we have to meet every standard of resistance and activism. That's not possible for everyone. Like we have to, we have to know our, our thing. Like, you know, what's the thing? Do you work in education and that's the thing you do? Or are you in politics and that's the thing you do? Are you in religious spaces and that's the thing you do, you know? like to trust ourselves and to trust our gifts to know this is my like this is my area and I'm gonna show up as my full self to that area and give all that I can because I know this is my spot you know to fight white supremacy to fight hate to fight all all of those things um but then holding on to that the macro and micro you know I don't know that's a yeah. that's a I'm constantly dealing with. <laughs> yeah, that that's so helpful because you know we we experience it in our churches. So you know that's another place for those who are still in who have still stayed in the church. You know, it's a big place for us to fight, and yeah. you know, and I find that is also tied in with land. And you talk about land. You quote Roseanne Dunbar Ortiz, who says everything in the U.S. history is about the land. So I find that so interesting because. I never saw it that way. And once you quoted and you and expanded on that, I thought this, yeah, it's so true. So um, tell us listeners how, you know, it is about the land and what can we do about this problem? Yeah. Um, when I think about colonization in the U.S. context, or even Canada, you could say, but in the U.S., um, the, the doctrine of discovery, which is something that a lot of people don't know about, yeah. um, was a set of documents that basically gave European Christian men the power to go to any land that they deemed uncivilized or not Christian, and they could basically do what they wanted there to make it what they wanted it to be, which meant that the indigenous peoples they encountered on those lands um, could be treated however they needed to be treated or removed, right, or killed. Um, and so that is the that is the history of what we find here. And there, there are so many books by indigenous authors. I'm looking at my books right now. Um, Nick Estes uh, has a book that talks about this um, specifically for women, women's bodies and connection to the earth. And anyway, there's multiple, multiple books I could recommend about this very topic of the land. What I would love for people to understand, all people, is that our bodies are connected to the land. Like our bodies are connected to mother earth, to Sugamakwe and colonization for one made the land into this thing, this commodity that could be sold, right. And, and taken and used, however they deemed fit. That's what capitalism has done. Right. Um, but then what happened in that was that our connection to the land, because our connection to the land should be this kinship, this sacred, we are well because the land is well, we are suffering because the land is suffering, right? So when the land is hurting and then our people are removed from that land or were killed or were oppressed and colonized, our connection, that sacred connection to the land is harmed. And in that we are harmed. It's like, I tell people that so much of our healing has to come from connecting to our child selves and connecting back to the earth again. And I, sometimes I have people um, in workshops and stuff, I have people write letters to the earth, like mm -hmm. as if you're having a, um, what is it called? Define the relationship conversation with someone that you're write a letter and talk to her. Like, I know that we've not been close in a while and this is how I want to repair this. And when I think of you, this is how I feel. And I hope that I can take these steps to return to our relationship or, or whatever it is, or I'm just really sad and I miss you or, you know, yeah. and in that way, we're connecting to a curious child, like part of ourselves that really needs that mother, that earth connection. And then we're also saying 
something has gone wrong and we want to fix it. I, I think that so much of our conversations and spirituality and climate activism and so much of it is so heady. We're not like embodying it. And when I'm sitting in a, and when someone comes to a talk and I'm forcing them to sit, not forcing them, but encouraging them to sit and write a letter to mother earth, it can be, people get really uncomfortable. I'll just say that because, because we're not used to this. We're not, we've not been taught to understand the earth this way, the land this way, and what possible healing could happen if we actually embodied it and what, like what change could it bring? Not just the micro change, but on the macro level. Um, and we have a lot of healing to do, you know, in that way. Yeah. So I think, uh, you know, that's so uh, wonderful and a good reminder for us to stay connected to the land. And you also mentioned about land acknowledgement. I grew up in Canada, so I'm more familiar with it. And so what are the problems or the use of doing it? Because Americans don't do it as right. well or as much as right. Canadians. So yeah, can you share a bit about that? Yeah, so I remember listening to um, a podcast in Canada. I think it was a, a CBC Indigenous podcast. Um, and. I remember on that podcast, I was listening to it a few years ago and they were interviewing an indigenous scholar who was talking about how land acknowledgements have become useless or they can become useless if they're not taken seriously in Canada. So I was thinking about this in, in, that, in that way that they're used a lot in Canada and in other parts of the world that are settler colonial states. Um, in America, we have people have hardly heard of them. Yeah. And so when I do one, I mean, one person thought that I had, I had discovered the, like that I made up the land acknowledgement. I was like, no, no, please don't ever think that like, um, you know, but that's how, that's how like unheard of they are in America. So the problem is how do we, um, take something seriously like this? The land acknowledgement is to, to name whose land you're on, to name their story. And then not just to like, leave it at that, but like, to start acting uh, in the present, you know, how can you, is it making amends? Is it, is it, um, I know one woman like pays rent to the, the tribe of the land, you know, she, she pays money to the tribe monthly as a way of I'm living in this land. And I want to acknowledge who you are, acknowledge your story, your history. Um, there are multiple ways that you can take a land acknowledgement seriously. And what I have seen is, you know, I show up at a talk and they're like, are you going to do a land acknowledgement today? And then some days I'm like, oh, I, have, I don't have one today. And so they're like, well, I'll just, I'll just type up real quick who, whose land I'm on. I'll do one real fast. And I'm like, that's painful for me because that's not, it's not a box to be ticked off yeah. is I guess what I want to say. Uh -huh. And when we start doing that, if in America we're already doing that, then we need to just scrap it and try to figure out what is the problem and listen to indigenous people. And I am not an expert on land acknowledgements. Um, I have followed other indigenous folks who have shared about this and who have wisdom on this that I do not hold. And, but what I, what I do know is that if it's not taken seriously and comes with action that, that is an action of repair or decolonization with indigenous people and listening, then it's, it's empty. Mm -hmm. And I'm not really interested in having, showing up to events that have empty. And I can, and I can tell, not everyone can tell, but a lot of us as indigenous folks can tell when they're, they're empty words. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. Um, you know, your book touches on so many things on whiteness, the Americanized God, um, and how, um, you know, the boarding school, you know, that's a huge problem, not just in the US, but in Canada and in Australia and different parts of the world. So, um, but there was, you know, I find, you know, we're running out of time, but I wanted to ask you about languages because you, you know, you, you, you learned your own native language as an adult and it brought tears to your eyes as you prayed in your language. And I just find, um, the word for America is, and I'm, I know I'm gonna, gonna say it right. Can you say it for me? Chimokmankik is one. Okay, Chimokmankik, yes, which yes. translates loosely, you're right, to white man with long knives. Yes. 
-hmm. I just, you know, that was just, it pierced me as I, because language for me is so important. I try to retrieve my own Korean language and use it in my own theology. And I tell my students, you know, when we're doing theology, word and language is the only thing we have. We're not in a biology class where I can bring this specimen. I can't bring God. So language, go ahead. That's true. What you, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, So I just find this word for America. So, wow. So can you say a bit more and then just talk about language and prayer? Yeah. 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 And then I'd love to read a poem at the end. Yes. Yeah. Uh Um, Yeah. You know, I didn't grow up knowing that our tribe had a language. I mean, it just, there was a lot we didn't talk about in our family and a lot that we were um, you know, just through trauma separated from aspects of our culture and, um, through, through generational trauma, multiple generations of that. And so like, I, I mean, I, I will always remember I'm standing in my, in my kitchen in our little apartment in Atlanta, realizing like, oh, like we have a language, our very own language, uh, that is shared by other indigenous people. And, and I can, I can push this button right now and I can hear it. And, um, and it, you know, it was Justin Neely, who's our language coordinator at my tribe and he's reading a poem. And I just, it was like, there was this corner of my heart that had been not available all my life and hearing those words, it was just prayer became something completely different and visceral in a way that I've never felt it, you know? And, and, and I think maybe people who, um, who have only ever prayed in English and then rediscover their people's language and then learn to pray in that. Maybe, maybe that's relatable, but it was very um, visceral and incredible for me. And so um, I'm still trying to learn <laughs> the same prayer is so much longer than I thought it was. So it's, you know, like you can do multiple sort of rounds and layers of the prayer. So I'm still trying to memorize it to to be a longer prayer. Um, but I have the core of that and I've taught it to my kids and, and learning the language, you know, I don't live by my tribe, so it's very isolating, but then I have this online language program. And that has been when, when colonization itself feels so heavy and, and painful and like physically painful, I can go and sit in front of my computer and just listen to these words in my, my ancestors language and revive them in my own soul. And that's like, that can set me toward healing for days, just being able to hear it, you know, and take it in. And so there is, I mean, I barely know anything. There's so much I need to learn. And I hope one day I can actually speak it fluently. Um, But to be able to learn, wow, the like the word for America isn't just America, the way we say it in English. In Potawatomi, words have these images that flash in your mind when you break them down. You like they're they're moving, they're words that have action to them, you know. And so when I learned that, I was like, this is this will absolutely be in my book as a lesson. And and I can't believe how um again, just how visceral like these words can land in my body and my spirit that name something that I've never been able to name, but they name something in our language. And um, so it's a gift. And I know that so many people from so many cultures who have been in whatever way through assimilation, trauma, whatever it is, separated from their people and are trying to relearn their language again, that is such a gift. And I know it can be really, really disheartening when we're not as good as we wanna be or when we can't practice it with people. And I would just encourage anyone who's trying to get back to their people's language to just keep going and to cherish any little word, any little sentence you say, like cherish it because it's a gift. It's a, it's a literal ancestral gift to us that we get to have that. And I will always count that as a huge part of my own healing. Oh, thank you so much for sharing that. These are like words that my kids have to learn or have to listen to because I grew up kicking and screaming, going to Korean language school. Yeah. And then my kids did the same thing. <laughs> I literally, they're like holding onto the car door and not getting out of the car. 
So, you know, and they're older, but I hope that they will really uh, have find more interest in learning the language. I know they are, but it's so difficult, as you say, to learn. But I think your words of wisdom of holding on to that, even one word or two, it really connects you to your people, to the land, and it has different it opens up new ways of thinking like that word for America. It's yeah. so true, but yeah. it, it's, it's so powerful. So I'm just so glad that you were able to share that because reading it was so powerful for me, but hearing it from your mouth is so powerful. And I hope all the listeners will be challenged, um, you know, and how we understand one another, how we understand language. So as we wrap up, um, you know, you wanted to share a poem. So can you share a poem uh, with us? Yeah. Or several poems if you want. Yeah. So this one is, um, this is from from part four of the book. And it's it's one of the really short ones, but I thought I'd read it just because it's just short and sweet, but I I really enjoyed writing it. Okay. (laughs) It's very very true of me. And I think probably a lot of us. Um, I am often in my own way. Instead of experiencing the universe, I write about experiencing the universe, while at that very moment, the wind had holy secrets to tell me. That's that one. That often we we want to write about what's holy instead of actually sitting and listening, (laughs) which is true, I think, for a lot of us. Yeah. You know, I love that poem because one of my books, Reimagining Spirit, the subtitle is Wind Breath and Vibration. I wish... I had that poem to insert it into my book. But anyway, read read us another one. It's so powerful. Um, Let's see. I'd like to actually read, this is not a poem, but it's a letter. This is for, this is a section. I, I wanted to write a little chapter on people who are mixed, Mm -hmm. maybe mixed race or mixed ethnicity and mixed culture, you know, there's so many of us who live in that liminal gray space. And I, I met a, a young woman and I asked her if I could write her a letter and put it in my book, which is probably very embarrassing for her and me. But, um, but I really was so touched by her experience and what it taught me and then becoming friends and just processing together all the shame or all the, I don't know, just we, in my experience so far, there's been so many spaces where we just haven't talked about people who are mixed, who live in different spaces and don't know how to process it. It's kind of that duality. We, yeah. um, we don't know how to, to handle the in-between. So yeah. it's easier to just put boxes for people to get to one or the other. But what about those of us who don't know which box to check sometimes, you know? So this is for, um, this is for all of you that might be experiencing this. Dear Alicia, I met you at a book club. You just read my first book and you told me that it woke something up in you. You told me that you don't know how to walk the hard road of being mixed, that you know it's going to be hard and that you don't know what it will look like. I liked you right away. I have noticed throughout my life that I am someone who lives in constant tension, a person who lives in gray spaces. When I met you, I knew I wasn't alone. Do you know that there are a lot of us? There are a lot of people walking a complicated journey, people with mixed heritage, races, ethnicities, cultures. They're asking what it means to be faithful in all things. They are asking if it's possible to live a decolonized life. They are asking if whiteness really has the last word. They are asking if the American church really has any room for them. Alicia, I have dreams. I dream of being someone who meets more people like us and calls out that which has long been forgotten, suppressed, and beaten down by cultures and systems of whiteness. I dream of saying to the mixed people in the room, you are enough. Give voice to that sacredness inside you that has long been told to be quiet. We are the ones who are told to be one thing or the other thing, to choose because we can't possibly inhabit more than one space at a time. We are told not to take up too much room at the table because there's barely enough room for us unless it can fully represent wanted whiteness. Hear me on this. Speaking into these spaces will cost us something. It will mean that we choose to forsake the call of assimilation, the pressure to pursue whiteness. It will mean that we are told we are too much and that we should calm down and that we make people uncomfortable. 
And yet we should speak and move and breathe from the spaces within us that are asking, asking to be given a voice. We can learn the language and ways of our ancestors. We can embrace our otherness until it becomes the thing that guides us all. Do not be afraid, but be empowered. We will fight together. We will dream together. We will remember together. And when it's hard, we will love ourselves together. Don't lose hope. Hope is the thing that will lead us. Oh, what a beautiful letter. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for writing the book. And thank you so much for being a guest on my Madame podcast. What a joy and honor and such a pleasure to have you to speak with you. And as I said at the beginning, I hope to meet you in person. And when you are done with your third book, I'm so excited about what you're writing on. Please do come back on Madame podcast. Thank you so much for sharing your poetry, your letter, your words of wisdom. Um, it's just a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone. This week's sponsor is Homebrewed Christianity's open online class, Upsetting the Powers, the Legacy of James Cohn. Xavier University professor of Black theology and student of James Cohn, Dr. Adam Clark, is partnering with Homebrewed Christianity in an exploration of the life, thought, and legacy of James Cone, the founder of Black Theology. If Black lives matter to our life as a species and a church, then it is time to listen to the voices who have already been speaking and living this gospel proclamation. In addition to six sessions exploring Cone's most powerful texts, there are six special guest sessions where friends and colleagues of Cone will share personally about his impact. These include scholars like Serene Jones, Kelly Brown Douglas, and Gary Dorian. This group is pay what you can, and you don't have to join live to get the video or audio of each session. To learn more and join over 1,000 others in the group, head to jamescohnwasright.com. The Buddhist Suu Kyi Foundation and Green Faith invites listeners to join us at Living the Change a global multi-faith initiative, journeying with people of faith, spirit, and conscience to change how we live as part of our response to the climate emergency. Through Living the Change, we aim to catalyze rapid and large reductions of personal greenhouse gas emissions of people of faith, spirit, and conscience as part of the collective pursued efforts to stay below the mean global warming temperature of 1.5 degrees Celsius. We focus specifically on changes that have the biggest impact on individual emissions in the heaviest polluting communities, changing how we travel, eat, and power our homes. Living the Change welcomes everyone who wants to walk gently on Earth together, while concentrating especially on people with the highest carbon footprints. To find out more, please visit www.livingthechange.net or follow us on Twitter and Facebook at Living the Change. Pacific Asian and North American Asian Women in Theology and Ministry will hold its 36th annual conference virtually from March 17 to 19, 2022. It will begin with a public forum on cross-racial solidarity in times like these on March 17 at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Leading Asian American, Latinx, and African American scholars will speak. To donate to Pan Autumn, please go to www.panautumn.org. Show your support and please order Invisible, available wherever books are sold. For sponsorship inquiries, please email madangpodcast.gmail.com.